see right away it wasn't i wasn't asking questions about the speaker so you know it's it's somewhat of a humble position to consider yourself the instrument the channel and that is beautiful and then you have the voice always remember you have the right to speak okay so are we ready yes everyone so we now have our judges in the main room each of them will say a quick hello and then we will begin our program Uh, Marie, can you say hello? <laughs> Absolutely, Nancy. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Marie Bridget Dundon, and I'm really, really very pleased to be with you this evening. I know it's such a busy time for everybody, so congratulations to those who have done so much work. I'm looking forward to it. Thank mm -hmm. you. And Marie teaches at Baruch College. Oliveira, can you say hi? Professor. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm so pleased and honored to uh, be here and be the judge one of my uh, with my colleagues. And I'm looking forward to seeing you and listening to your be beautiful speeches. And I'm graduate for be uh, brave to speak up. Uh, I mm -hmm. teach at Hunter College. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Professor Michaels. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am thrilled to be here. I echo what Nancy has said. Um, no matter how many degrees you have, no matter how many licenses and diplomas, your presence, your voice is your calling card. And to all of you who have honed your talents and have done this, I applaud you. Winners, every single one of you are winners in my eye. I'm very impressed. I, I have a small PR firm and we will be notating the winners and I will make sure that everybody is celebrated for their commitment and their contribution here. Thank you, best of luck to everyone. I teach at Kingsborough, I teach theater, and I teach speech. Yes, notice we have a lot of theater and a lot of communication people. <laughs> they go hand in hand. Duh. It's all about giving your audience, the audience is the most important aspect. Without an audience, we have no reason to speak. We have no reason to perform. And what are we doing? We are both theater and communication studies. We're communicating a message according to the meaning that we give, that we interpret. Okay, um, Dr. Sokowski is another judge and she's in black and white, so you can't miss her. <laughs> Hello, I just don't look good in color. So um, <laughs> it's purely vain. So <laughs> Patricia Sokowski, I'm in the communication studies area of LaGuardia Community College. Welcome everyone. I'm looking forward to all this speeches. Thank you. Yes. And Professor Romaine, believe you can do it. Yes, that is a perfect motto. In fact, I am going to borrow it and keep <laughs> the borrow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Bandera. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here this evening um, to facilitate the success of these students who've been granted access to share their voices and to take ownership of their voices and the space which portends that they will be able to certainly um, own spaces when they graduate and mm -hmm. as they move on in their careers. So I should like to congratulate each and every single one of the students who's here because you have done well and it's truly, um, you're truly to be commended for the work that you've done and for the work that you will continue to do. Uh, today is merely a subjective moment where there will perforce be a, a, a first place person and a last place person, but no that um, 
what you do here is not a question of first or second or last place. It is that as a matter of having access to space, that you are all first place um, individuals. And I thank you so much for your hard work. Be well. Yes, thank you. And then we've got, um, I don't think you've met Dr. Jamie Riccio. Riccio. Um, Jamie, she is, um, she's our faculty member at LaGuardia in communication studies, and she also runs uh, the web radio. Jamie, do you want to say hello? Oh, she may be busy. Um, recording well, or something. We will be sure to get back in touch with Jamie a little bit later, perhaps in our okay. program. I'd like to thank Dr. Nancy Vandiera for her enthusiasm each year and the efforts that she undergoes to ensure that we can come together to share our skills persuasively as well as informatively. Thank you to the judges and all of our wonderful participants and observers, attendees tonight. So let's get started with our program. As I mentioned a short while ago, we will be starting off with the informative category and the first student speaker will be Jasmine. Following Jasmine will be Natalie. So please keep in mind for all participants, if you would like to share your screen, there is a green button on the lower, um, the lower part of your screen that says share screen. So ultimately you can click that if you need to. If you do have audio, please be sure to click the share audio button in the lower left corner. All now, right. if, if they have um, PowerPoints, do I need to make them a co-host? That's what I usually do in my classes. No, no need to make okay. them co-host because the, um, the option has been enabled for individuals to share their okay. screens. Thank you. Students can do that. Great question. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll check in with Jasmine. Jasmine, are you ready? Yes, I am. Wonderful. All right. So without further ado, we will turn it over to Jasmine. Now, everybody, you can click in the view. You could click speaker and then just see the speaker. Okay. Did you know? that 3.1% of the total population of children from birth to age three receive early intervention services? Hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine Collier. As an early childhood educator, I've seen firsthand how impactful early intervention can be. You may be a parent, you may be a student studying to be a teacher, or you may know someone who has expressed concerns about their child's development and do not know what early intervention is. Today, you will learn more about early intervention, also known as EI. I want to begin by covering what early intervention is, Morning in progress. then cover the basic steps of the early intervention process. And last, I will share some outcomes of early intervention in New York State. Let's get into it. What exactly is early intervention? According to the National Dismentation for Children with Disabilities, early intervention is described as a provision of services and support for infants and toddlers with developmental delays and diagnosed disabilities. Similarly, the Early Intervention Foundation says, early intervention means identifying and providing effective early support to children and young people who are at risk of poor outcomes. Effective early intervention works to prevent problems or tackle them head on before a problem gets worse. So now that you know what the early intervention is, let's get into the basic steps of the early intervention process. Here are the steps. First, a concern is identified. This is usually identified by a teacher, a parent, or a doctor. Second, once the concern, based on the concern, a referral is submitted to an early intervention agency. The agency will work closely with the families to schedule an evaluation. Third, an evaluation is conducted, usually done in the child's home. Fourth, the evaluation is completed and the family is notified if the child was found eligible. Fifth, if the child is found eligible, they will then attend a meeting 
where they will go over the Individualized Family Service Plan, also known as the IFSP. Here, they will get details on the services and support that they will receive. If the child was not found eligible, they are able to repeat the process in six months. Now I would like to direct your attention to the screen. Here is a chart that is, was given by the New York State Department of Health. And in this chart, you can see the early intervention steps in more detail. Okay, are you still with me? Yes. Now that you know the basic steps of the early intervention process, you may be wondering, how exactly do we know that this actually works? It's time to review some data. On my screen now, I will share the data that the New York State Department has, has conducted based on their annual performance review. This data is from 2020. So I know you may see a whole bunch of numbers and percentages, and you may not understand what exactly this means. So let me get into what the data says. In 2020, 80% of the targeted children who exited EI at the age of three met their goals. Mm -hmm. The highest percentage of children had speech delays. 41% of these children finished near the same level as their peers. 32% finished at the same level as their peers, leaving only 27% of children below level. And this is just some of the data that has shown early intervention to be effective. So considering all this, studies have shown that when children get help with delays early, they are able to have a better chance of reaching their full potential. My hope is that after learning what early intervention is, the basic steps of the early intervention process, and sharing some outcomes of the success that early intervention has had in New York State, you are able to share this information with someone who may need this support. Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone for listening. And again, my name is Jasmine Collier. Ah, you know, as a teacher, <laughs> as a vocal coach, I want to make a lot of comments, but I don't want to <laughs> sway the audience. So I will just do a clap. And um, Netanel is here. Um, uh, Cheyenne. Um, yeah. That now was on the program. Perhaps not, I'm not sure if he's ready. He, he oh, indicates I, so. I think he's here just as support today. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. You really, Professor Michaels, you look like a TV news <laughs> person. <laughs> I should get paid like one. Uh, oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. When that's what teachers need to raise their salaries up to with TV personalities. You won't hear me complain, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jasmine. We appreciate your, uh, your informative speech and of course your willingness to go first this evening. So next up we have Natalie. Natalie will be our next speaker, everyone. And just so we're staying on track of the schedule, Galila will follow Natalie. All right, so Natalie, are you ready? I'm ready, yes. I'm going to share my screen now. Wonderful. Okay, can you all uh, see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. In the 2011 journal article, When Nature Rebels, International Migration, Climate Change and Inequality, Mark Yodi and Schumacher state that, very often, the only hope left for people is to move away from the uninhabitable area to one that might give them better living conditions. Hello, my name is Natalie Kuhne. Climate change is serious. Everyone will be affected and many are already affected. Ex 
Extreme weather events due to climatic changes happen more and more frequently close to my home in Germany. Floods and especially wildfires. Today I'm going to talk about migration induced by climate change throughout the course of history, three reasons for climatic change, so for climate migration in our today's world, and one effect of climate change on the mapping of our world. Let me come to my first point, which is migration due to climate changes since the beginning of human history. While humans have been migrating since the beginning of history, there are various reasons for why they relocated. And one of those reasons is the climate. There are so-called push and pull factors. Push factors are factors that push people out of a certain area or region. Grunewald describes in her article, Early Human Migration from 2017, that with regard to these early human migrations, rather think of stuff like the climate taking a turn for the worse and turning places into huge ovens or freezers where barely anything can live or grow or natural disasters. Pull factors on the other hand side are pull factors that pull people to a certain area or region because the climate might be better over there or there are better or more food options and resources. To give you a more, uh, a more concrete example for that is that there was a time that the climate turned much colder and more arid in Northern Africa and Eastern Europe, while the climate in Southern Europe was much better for people to live in, which was the reason why many people migrated to Southern Europe. In the article, Human Migration, Climate and the Peopling of the World from 2016, the Minocle and Stringer explain that between 12,000 to 5,000 years ago, the vast Sahara was nearly completely vegetated with wooded grasslands, permanent lakes and rivers. The region was alive with people and cultural activity until about 5,000 years ago, when the monsoon rains weakened and retreated as a result of changes in the Earth's orbit. Archaeological records document a massive and rapid depopulation out of the northern African interior. After I have talked about migration and since the beginning of human history, let's come to my second point, which are the reasons for climate migration in our today's world. While humans, uh, humans still migrate in our today's world, but since our world has changed and since we live in a more globalized world, the reasons are a little bit different, and this is because of the climate crisis. The climate has already changed in the past, but it changes much faster now and is also more extreme. There are, uh, there are severe, unpredictable, and destructive weather events. One reason for why humans migrate nowadays are rising temperatures and droughts, which turn regions into uninhabitable deserts. A second reason is the rise of the sea level, which affect people that live in coastal areas. In a 2008 report from the International Organization of Migration, Hugo describes that almost two thirds of the world's population live within 100 kilometers of the, coast, of the coast, and 30 of the world's largest 50 cities are located on the coast. The potential for population displacement from significant rise in sea level is considerable. Lastly, other reasons for climate migration are extreme weather events, for example, heat that causes wildfires, changes in rainfall patterns, floods, hurricanes, and tsunamis. After I have talked about the reasons why humans migrate in our modern world, let's come to my next point, which are the places that are mostly going to be affected by climate change and the places from which many people are going to migrate from. It is important to say that climate migration is already happening. Many people are already leaving their homes and looking for more livable areas. I will focus my third point on climate migration due to the rise of the sea level. In this first image, you can see how the sea level rise is going to affect our whole world. And we can see um, that especially the Southeast Asia is going to be affected, but also the coasts of Europe and of the Americas. Some island nations are even going to dis com disappear completely. Um, cities worldwide, for example, Cancun, Buenos Aires, Sydney, Venice, London, Hamburg, and Copenhagen are going to be affected by the rise of the sea level. In this following image, you can see how the sea level rise is going to be affect the United States. So in blue, we can see the areas that are going to, um, how the sea level rise is going to affect the United States, which are basically all coasts of the United States. 
And in red, we can see the areas where many people are going to migrate to. So from these blue areas to the red areas. And we can see that major US cities such as Boston, um, New York, Philadelphia, Miami, Northern, North New Orleans and Houston are going to be directly affected by the rise of the sea level. This last image shows a map with the future most livable areas despite the climate change. And these areas are located around the North Pole. So the areas include Canada and the Northern United States, the Northern European countries, as well as Russia and Siberia. The question now is, are these areas safe from severe weather events and drastic climatic changes? In a journal article from Katola from 2015, she states that they are going to be affected by extreme weather events, such as storms, hurricanes, and or tornadoes, floods, and droughts, but not as severely as in the southern parts of the world. Their temperatures will rise, but not as high as in the south. Many of the northern coastal areas will probably become uninhabitable but the northern inland areas may remain inhabitable longest on the earth. This rise of the sea level is going to um, cause a relocation of millions of people worldwide. Oh yeah, I wanna go back, okay, sorry. Um, after I've shown you some images with concrete examples of how the climate change is going to affect our world, let's sum up all the information that I have given you today. Today, I have informed you about climate-driven movements throughout the course of history, fly migration in our today's world, and a possible or probable remapping of the world. Many areas will become uninhabitable, which is the reasons for why people are going to look for places that give them better living conditions. After I have covered the migrations of humans due to climatic changes, I hope that you have a better idea of the reasons why humans migrated in the past and why they migrate nowadays and the regions where many people are going to migrate to and from. My name is Natalie and thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank Natalie. You. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say, although I'm dying to say so much more. <laughs> Thank you so much. Maybe we can talk when the judges are, um, you know, deliberating. Maybe we can talk about all the issues that have, are, are being brought up. That would be great. Okay, Cheyenne. Great. Thank you so much, Natalie. So next we will move on to the last speaker in the informative category, which is Kalila. And just a friendly reminder, following that presentation, the first speaker in the persuasive category will be Shani. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Many of us tend to blindly believe individuals in their expert field. We trust doctors, accountants, and car mechanics, assuming their expertise guarantees accuracy. However, trusting experts without questioning their assumptions can lead to unexpected and significant consequences. Hi, I'm Galila, and I learned this lesson the hard way after I had to question a professional's recommendation of my child. When my five-year-old daughter had a speech delay, she was placed in a self-contained class at our zone school by a group of educators called the IB team. This group works together to develop an individualized educational plan for children who need special education services. Lacking knowledge, I initially agreed to their recommendation. However, after doing my research and observing my daughter's progress before the start of the school year, I started to question whether that placement was the best for her. I tried to reach out to the team to discuss her progress and explore different options, but I was completely ignored. 
left with no other option, my husband and I decided to cancel her services and give her a fresh start, even though we were worried about the possibility of her regression. This decision did not sit well with the IB team, and we were finally scheduled an IB meeting. In the meeting, I found myself surrounded by 10 school educators who are using hard to comprehend words, making it difficult for me to follow their argument. They tried to convince us that their recommendation was in my daughter's best interest and a different placement would hinder her education and set her back academically. However, they did not seem to acknowledge her growth, nor they were willing to do another evaluation to assess her progress. Despite their objection, I stood firm in canceling my child's services to give her the right educational environment that fits her needs. It was not an easy decision and it came with consequences. After signing the cancellation form, we were informed that she could no longer stay in that school because there were no more available spots for her in the regular class at that time. Furthermore, we had to transfer her to another school that was far away from us. I left the meeting holding back my tears, feeling worried, confused, and doubtful, but I knew I had to trust my instinct and keep fighting for my child. The following year, we returned to the school, but this time my daughter was placed in first grade general education class without needing any special education services. This sent a message to the school's IB team that I did not disagree with their assessment to prove them wrong or to deny my daughter's situation. Rather, I was advocating for what I believed was best for my daughter and her future development. And ultimately, I was proven correct. This experience was not an easy or comfortable journey, but it was a rewarding and empowering one. I learned that while it's important to respect and value the expertise of professionals in their fields, it's equally important to approach their opinions, to approach their opinions with critical thinking and a healthy dose of skepticism. It's crucial to remember that as individuals, we have unique experiences and perspectives that can inform our decision-making process. We should not blindly rely on experts to make important decisions for us or our loved ones, as our own insights and intuitions may be valuable and determine what is best for our specific situation. Therefore, it's essential to ask questions, seek additional information, and engage in a dialogue with experts to gain a better understanding of their recommendations and how they may apply to our unique circumstances. By doing so, we can make more informed decisions and take an active role in shaping our own future and the future of those we care about. After all, we are the experts of our own life. Thank you. Thank you, Galea. Oh, my goodness me. Once again, mm -hmm. I want to speak, but I shall not speak. <laughs> um, Cheyenne, who's next? All right. Thank you so much, Galila. So next up, we have Shani. Following Shani will be Genesis. Good evening, my fellow CUNY students, CUNY faculty and staff. Just give me one second, please. <laughs> and once again, everyone, as, as Shani takes the time needed, I'd like to remind everyone that we are now moving on to the persuasive category. All right, I just want to ask, can you see this? Yes. Can you, can you see that? All right, all right, all right. Okay. And scene. What's the quickest way to grow? by listening. Now, that's not really the question I want to ask you. My question is, who are you going to listen to? My name is Shani Preek, and I want to talk a little bit about mentoring. Right now, I personally am being mentored by three professors. One is from the KBCC mentoring program. The other two are PhDs with extensive experience in mentoring. 
One of these is my anthropology professor, who is a former head of the honors board, and the other is a practicing psychologist for more than 15 years. Now, what exactly is mentoring? Well, mentoring is defined as a relationship in which a mentor facilitates the personal and professional growth and development of another practitioner. Mentoring is receiving personalized instructions to help further your growth. Now look, like I mentioned before, there's only one way to grow by listening, and that's it. But the question is, who do you listen to and when? Will you listen after you have gone through the downs of life? Or will you take the shortcut and nip things in the bud? Mentoring allows you to use the experiences, perspectives, and insight of your mentors to grow and develop. I personally love being mentored. Why? Because I grow when I have more experienced people catch and hold me accountable for what I say or do. And if I need assistance of any kind, then I can freely request it from them. I was on the student panel for an open pedagogy meeting on the 27th a few weeks ago. There were three students. I was one of them. The other was an alumni, and the third guy was graduating this semester. On his bio, he had written that he was an honor student, like me, a PTK member, like me, and a member of the NSLS, the National Society of Leadership and Success. Oh, and he was going to Columbia. Now, those last two things really caught my attention. Now, I don't know about getting into Columbia, but I was curious as to how he got into this program. Why? Can I get a leg up? Yeah, let me get a leg up. I asked him the procedure, but received a non-answer. He just got an email from them. I checked the website, and it seemed legitimate. But I mean, what do I know? I didn't see a way to get in, but figured out they wanted $95. For membership. So I emailed my anthropology professor asking her if it's worth spending my time and money chasing, chasing after this, getting into the NSLS. Her simple response was clear enough. It's not worth your $95 or your time. And that solved my issue instantly. Now you may be wondering that this is all right, but how exactly how does mentoring help you to grow? Well, according to studies and peer-reviewed journals, mentoring positively impacts student satisfaction levels with academic programs and increases professional productivity in research, publications, and presentations. Look, school doesn't have to be arduous and tedious. Neither does your workplace. If you have mentors helping you out, you will find great satisfaction in your work. If you want to know how it plays a part professionally, listen carefully. Research shows mentored students have increased career success, organizational commitment, and better job performance. From a study of over 20 types of mentoring programs, the most common things that mentees learned were one, knowledge acquisition, meaning gaining clinical skills, curriculum skills, and research skills. Number two, developing professional behaviors, which means having a client-based attitude, working as a team, learning how to lead, and confronting ethical dilemmas. Number three is being productive. Do the work. Complete academic assignments, presentations, papers, research projects, and engaging in grant writing, because you got to chase the moolah. Networking, something akin to LinkedIn building professional networks, professional supports, and mentoring relationships. Look, we live in a community. As my anthropology professor likes to remind me, humans are social animals. They thrive on social interaction. Now, this was specifically in relation to the blank black boxes that she sees in class on Zoom, but I digress. We live in a society. We are surrounded by people that we love and enjoy being with. Friends, family, relatives, neighbors, the, the eccentric down the hall, whoever. By being mentored, we learn what it means to have a valuable and beneficial relationship with other people. And then later, we can pass it along to the young'uns, to the next generation. Now, let me ask you something else. 
What about you? What about you mentoring? You should. You should mentor. Because others suffering from the same problems you faced in the past could use your solutions, your perspective, your insight. Then they won't have to make the same mistakes that you did or waste time or incur any, any kind of trauma or bad experience. By mentoring, you also reap rewards. It's not a one-way street. According to studies, mentoring helps one to develop their own academic skills to become resilient, courageous, and more compassionate towards others. This helps them better sustain their professional practices and serve clients, students, and others in a larger capacity. Mentoring is not something wholly unique. Everyone goes through this stage one way or another. But for most people, it is very informal and extremely brief. If you want to reap the full benefits of mentoring by being either or both a mentee and a mentor, you must approach it in a more systematic manner. Get a proper mentor, be properly mentored, and then help others in the same way that you were assisted. Even by assisting others, you gain benefits. I recently read a story regarding Steve Jobs. Yeah, the Apple guy, the CEO. During this particular incident, Jobs was CEO of Pixar. This was in 95, mind you. So there were discussions regarding sharing information between Pixar and Intel, the place where Jobs' mentor, Andy Grove, was a CEO. When an engineer one day shot Jobs an email asking for a follow-up, explaining how Intel could benefit from Pixar's teachings, Jobs asked for remuneration. The engineer put the current meeting on hold and said, we never discussed financial arrangements. This was simply about exchanging good ideas. This made Jobs furious enough to send Grove an email calling this engineer out. And you know what Grove did? He said, Steve, the engineer is right. There was no financial agreement. And there were plenty of times where I helped you without any commercial exchange. He also stated that if Jobs did not want to help Intel, it was his choice, but that we will be, we will be worse off as a result. And so will the industry. Jobs responded five days later, admitting that he was wrong and that he had changed his position 180 degrees. He ended his email with, thanks for the clearer perspective. And that is what a mentor does. They give you a clear and objective perspective at times when you really need to hear it. And that is why I say, why wait for growth? My name is Shani Parikh, and I say, go and find your mentor. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. <laughs> I wish you could come to every single class of mine until someday I retire. <laughs> You're not going to retire. <laughs> okay, Cheyenne. All right. Thank you, Shani. We are doing fabulously here, everyone. Next up, we have Genesis. And following Genesis will be Hamza. Hello. Can you all hear me very well? Yes. Okay. Let me. Okay. So you all could see that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So good evening faculty and fellow CUNY students. My name is Genesis Oswanye, and I would like to share a statistic with you that I think you all should hear. The American Optometric Association has surveyed over a thousand American adults ages 18 and up and found that 58% of those adults complained from computer eye strain, digital eye strain. Additionally, 59% of those adults complained that it was the computers and desktops that bothered them the most. 
Being that we are all here dwelling in the age of advanced technology, and in this moment, sitting in front of an electronic device, you could probably relate to that statistic. So I would like to ask you, are you experiencing computer vision syndrome, also known as CVS? I will convince you on why computer vision syndrome is a dilemma detrimentally impacting our eye health. And so in this presentation, I will elucidate what CVS is, the signs and symptoms of CVS, the causes of CVS, and lastly, some simple yet effective solutions that you must urgently implement in your life to combat the effects of CVS. So what is CVS? The National Health Institute has explained that CVS is a complex of eye and vision problems that stress the near vision from, from activities such as computer use. To affirm a diagnosis of CVS, Mount Sinai's health system explains that your doctor will search for signs of red eyes, dry eyes, abnormal pupil dilation, or an excess buildup of mucus. On the other hand, again, the American Optometric Association claims that you are more likely to undergo symptoms of eye strain, blurred vision, light sensitivity, tension headaches, or shoulder, neck, and back pain. But what exactly causes CVS? On November 1st, 2021, Dr. Bajic at the Cleveland Clinic explained that when you sit at your computer screens for long periods of time, you often forget to blink. And that is what causes your cornea to dry out, leading to that redness and dryness that the doctor observes and that itch and burn that you feel. But a lack of blinking doesn't only just cause your eyes to dry out. You are also subjecting your eyes to an intense glare that our computers, that your computer is constantly emitting, paving the way for blurred vision to occur and light sensitivity to plague you. But it's not only just a lack of blinking that may cause computer vision syndrome. It's your poor posture when you sit at your computer screen. Oftentimes, the ratio from our line of vision to where our computers are seated is often disproportionate. So in return, you view your computer screen in an uncomfortable manner, causing that eye strain and that physical strain to occur. And that's when you get the blurred vision. That's when you get the shoulder, neck, and back pain. So now that I've covered some main causes of CVS, let's now shift gears and take a look at some self-disciplinary actions that you can engage in to hinder the effects of CVS. Christine Nunez, on March 4th, 2021, wrote an article on the solutions of CVS that were medically reviewed by Dr. Vicente Diaz. And the first solution that I would like to bring to your attention is the 20-20-20 rule, which suggests that for every 20 minutes, you take a 20 second break and view something that is 20 feet away from you. This is an eye reparative exercise, which gives you that break away from that intense glare that your computer screen is exuding. And it also, gives you frequent opportunities to blink and moisten your cornea. Another suggestion, I'm sorry, another solution is blue light glasses, such as the ones that I have right here. Now these are mine and I ordered these from Amazon. And although they are exaggerated and don't help with eye strain, they do massively reduce that intense glare that our screens are constantly emitting. It is very helpful to relax the strain that your eyes are enduring. Another solution, is to consider lubricative eye drops. And as far as the shoulder, neck, and back pain, make sure that your computer screens are about, about five inches below your line of vision and 20 inches away from your face in general. Start to invest in your health. Reduce the monitor, the screen time. Reduce it so that you are eliminating CVS and releasing the strain that your eyes are constantly enduring. CVS is troublesome. I never said it wasn't, but with the solutions that I have previously mentioned, if habitually incorporated into your lifestyle, you can eliminate CVS. So with that being said, understand that your eyes deserve more. So do more for them and liberate them from the strain that they are enduring. And so with that being said, I would like to thank you for listening to my presentation, and I will open the floor to any questions that any of you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now wait till we talk. <laughs>
Okay, I is there there's one more right to Cheyenne. Yes, we actually have two more speakers. Okay. In that. So next up will be Hamza. And again, I'd like to thank Genesis for her presentation. And so I'd also like to say that after Hamza will be our last speaker of, of the evening, and that will be Nina. Good evening, everyone. Sorry. Let me just set this up really quick. Mm -hmm. My apologies. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Oh, you're okay. waiting for it. Okay. Sorry. Oops, 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 oops. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> one second, one second. So sorry. Okay. So no sorry. No need to rush. Please take your time. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. All right. Let's try that again. All right, let's start. I knew that when I chose this topic, it'd be a taboo one. I mean, think about it. Imagine a stranger here speaking about such an intimate topic. Sorry. Uh -huh. Well, calm your concerns. I'm only here to give you some reasons on why you should try this new cool thing I found. With that being said, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hamza Moore. For many Americans, Using toilet paper is the only method we know when it comes to cleaning our, ourselves after answering the call to nature. Now, I'm American myself, so of course that was the only method I knew when it came to cleaning ourselves. But there are more methods, more hygienic ways. And the method I would like all of us to use is the bidet. So, let's enter the bidet. <laughs> this innovative plumbing fixture uses a gentle stream of water to clean your intimate areas, providing a better, more hygienic cleaning experience than just toilet paper alone. And while many Americans may be hesitant to try something new, if you only use toilet paper, you should definitely give this bidet a chance for at least a month. And today I'll be talking about the environmental benefits on about why you should use a bidet, why it's a smart investment for your health, wealth, and well-being, and why it's better than the alternatives. And by the end of the speech, you may just find yourself convinced to give the bidet a chance. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of the bidet with regards to health, let's talk about the environment and how the bidet benefits it. When it comes to environmental impact, it is no secret that using toilet paper leaves a massive footprint on society. In fact, according to a 2009 article by Andrew Romano, tossing all toilet paper in America would save 15 million trees, 17.3 terawatts of electricity, and more than 473 billion gallons of water each year annually. To add, a 2019 article by Business Insider stated a mind-blowing fact. It takes about 37 gallons of toilet paper to make a single roll of toilet paper. I'll let that sink in for a minute. 37 gallons of water to create a single roll of toilet paper. That's a huge amount of resources that we could be saving if we just switched to something more sustainable, like the bidet. Unlike toilet paper, bidets use a small amount of water. In fact, the environmental impact of a bidet is tiny comparing to the toilet paper. So by using a bidet, you do, you do your part to save trees, water, and energy. In addition to the eco-friendly advantages of using the bidet, it can have a positive impact on your finances, as stated by homeimprovementdude.com. The author of that website, homeimprovementdude.com, said while the initial investment in a bidet may be higher than purchasing toilet paper, the long-term savings can be substantial. He also cites a study that found bidet users save an average of $243 per year on toilet, cost, toilet paper costs alone. 
So by choosing to install a bidet in your home, you not only enjoy the environmental benefits, but you also save money in the long run. I mean, look, it's a win-win situation. Now, finally, the section which you should concern yourself with, the health benefits. To start, according to the article, Be Kind to Your Behind, an Evidence-Based Complementary and Alternative Medicine of 2022, but days could potentially be effective and affordable treatment for hemorrhoids and anal fissures. This finding is important as it offers a simple and accessible alternative to traditional treatments such as medications and surgeries. But days are objectively, objectively the better option when it comes to personal hygiene. Unlike toilet paper, which can, you know, cause irritation, skin irritation to your delicate skin, but days use water to clean gently and thoroughly. Water is way better at removing uh, bacteria and germs. It's literally water, one of the most purest forms of liquids. Overall, using a bidet can have a positive impact on your health and well-being. And while I believe that this is the best method when it comes to cleaning ourselves, there is another, wipes. But at what cost? Not only to your pockets, but to the environment. Wipes expensive, you know, add up and are bad for the environment. According to the Atlantic who wrote an article on the revival of bidets, while wipes are far more accessible than washlets, bidets, they've also created major damage to our sewer systems. Wet wipes clog up sewer systems, causing environmental issues you most likely won't ever see. They also made with chemicals like additives and fragrances, which can be harmful to your body. They pollute the earth we live in even more, and yes, even the flushable ones. Some may say, but days only use water. Therefore, they waste more water. Well, no, like mentioned before, it takes about 37 gallons to make a single roll of toilet paper compared to just two cups of water, which is the equivalent of using two cups of water just to clean yourself with a bidet. So to compare the creation of toilet paper alone, this argument falls completely flat. Lastly, some may argue it is hard to install. I disagree. I mean, mine took 15 minutes, less than 15 minutes, and it's been working for years. So if I can install it, I'm pretty sure any Joe Smo could. And so I ask, what are we doing, America? Let's be better. Supposedly, we're the greatest country on earth. Are we, though? Hygienically speaking, we have countries like Japan who have basically mastered hygiene and perfected the bidet while we are lacking behind in that. This is not to put America down. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is to motivate us. It's time for us to take care of ourselves. Come on. I want us all to consider the bidet. Pull out Amazon, put it in your cart. My hope is that at least you'll give it a chance. So I conclude with this. Hello, Americans. Get yourself cleaned up. Embrace cleansiness. Get a bidet. Thank you. Wow. The only thing I will say, Hamza, is in all the years that I have taught, this particular persuasive topic has never come up. <laughs> well, I hope you consider the day. <laughs> <laughs> Wrote it down. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Hamza. So moving on to our final speaker of the evening, we will welcome Nina. Nina, are you ready for us? Yes, hi. Hello there. All right, so feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Okay. Do you think twice about what you're eating? Or do you believe that you should be consuming high amounts of meat because that's what's been deemed the norm. Did you know about all the other many forms of biocentric protein that you could be choosing from? Your daily actions accumulate over time and you can save your planet by just cutting out 50% of meat intake from all three meals. There's currently no taxation on meat, even though its production is one of the main contributors to climate change, which is the demise of our one and only planet Earth. I'm wildly passionate about a real balanced diet because our diet and gut health contributes directly to mental health. Healthy equals happy. There is no taxation on meat, and it has been proven that the food pyramid...
Nina, unmute yourself, please. I'm muted, really. Sorry. Was I muted for the whole thing? No. Um, oh. Just go back. Um, uh, start where, uh, right after you say that meat um, destroys the planet. Okay, I'm sorry for the background noise. Yeah. yeah. I'm wildly passionate about a real balanced diet because our diet and gut health contributes directly to our mental health. Healthy equals happy. There's no taxation on meat. It has been proven that the food pyramid taught from 1992 to 2011 was completely wrong once fact checked. What we put into our body directly impacts our health and our planet. So why should you care about what's being put into your body? Aside from the fact of it being your body, what you choose to eat, to buy to eat directly impacts the environment of the whole planet. So many people don't care about what they're putting into their body since it's so cheap and easy to get fast food. People think, I'm just one person. How could I have any real impact at all? These people are selling themselves short. Everything every person consumes, materialistic or edible, contributes to the future state of themselves and their environment. So what's your idea of a plant-based diet? It's, I can tell you it's not just salads. There are more than 800 companies that produce meat alternatives, expanding to all supermarkets. Beyond and Impossible Burgers are uncanny. There was a study done between um, a regular burger and an Impossible Burger, and it was uncanny. It's not just companies, or not just meat companies, but you can substitute meat for tofu, beans, mushrooms, the list goes on to get that your amount of protein per day, per meal. These plant-based companies are so passionate because they see these animals, cow, pig, chicken, as life forms, and don't use the power that we inherited as humans, having all the accessible technology that we have today. Meat alternatives are so widely produced now because it takes so much to compete against when there's little to no taxation on the product of meat. So what would happen if there was a taxation on meat production? Companies would be held responsible for the amount that they contribute to climate change. Laws would be put into place for that taxes farmers for the cleanliness of their cattle, the amount of greenhouse gases that these animals are in, and then we eat them afterwards. Fast food companies can charge so little for buckets of chicken and burgers because there's little to no limitation in the industry. So what kind of diet do you think your body deserves? The United States of America is the highest consumer of meat at a whopping 95% of the population with 20% of global consumption. It's so accessible to us because fast food is cheap and everywhere. 99% of chain restaurants in America are not plant-based. The thing most people lean towards, it's what's, it's what's easy, and that's supporting fast food and getting a burger. It's not going to make anyone live longer, especially yourself. Do what you want and do what you want to choose. What's, do you want to choose what's cheap and easy and detrimental, or do you want to prolong life for yourself, your great-grandchildren, and animal species? Are you willing to expand your diet out to new forms of protein to ensure not only your health and lifespan, but also use your power as a human to help all life forms on earth to continue to live beyond the estimated 2050 demise if you don't. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the noise. And I hope all that I said resonated. <laughs> Thank you. Another way to care for the environment. Very important. Nina, can may I ask where are you? I'm outside. I'm sorry, I couldn't be in my house for right now. Yeah, I was alone. Oh, you look like you're on an exotic vacation. Oh. Really? What's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> And I was thinking, wherever she is, is I want to go there. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Now, Cheyenne, shall we take a break and let the judges do their work? We'll take a few minutes break and then all come back together just to talk to each other. 
which is a very nice thing to do in the name of communication. Great idea. I will go ahead and move the judges into a private breakout room so they can deliberate. Would you like to share with the attendees how long this break will be? Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, how long do you think the judges will need? Um, 10 minutes, 15 maybe. Do you think 15 minutes? I think that's a great starting point. So it's just about 8.10. Perhaps we can invite everyone to come back on screen. Um, At 8.30. Okay, so that would be about 20 minutes. Um, but yeah, we can perhaps between you know 8.25, 8.30, come back in and uh, I'll, I'll continually check in with the judges to see um, how, yeah. they're, how they're doing. Okay. Now, so uh, sorry, for all of the judges, you will see an announcement. Um, Dr. Bandiera, is there something you wanted to say to the judges before they step away virtually? Um, just uh, critically think, creatively think, and don't talk all at once. <laughs> okay, yes, um, we're going to like... Um, We'll definitely be here at 8.30, and uh, uh, Cheyenne will check between 8.25 and 8.30. In the meantime, I think we could have five-minute break, all of us. I know that I need to stretch for my back, and I need that 2020. Oh, they shouldn't record this. Yeah, we don't have to record. Just let me just click not. Okay. Not recording. No, it is. It says recording. No, recording paused. No.